Any education apart from Jesus Christ is for us miseducation. And it produces not education nor an educated man, but a new race of barbarians who are today busily destroying their civilization. Humanistic education is the institutionalized love of death. Christian education, because it serves him who says, I am the way, the truth, and the light, is the love of life. This is the Love of Life Podcast, Conversations with Jesse and Courtney. Okay, well, here we are, another episode of the Love of Life podcast. We have a special guest with us tonight. We have someone you may be familiar with. He has been known as Audio Wade at a tiny little news organization called Louder with Crowder before he went on to uh, a big job at Canon Press, and we are happy to have Wade Stotts with us tonight. So, Wade, thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Yes, absolutely. And obviously, that's tongue-in-cheek. I mean, Louder with Crowder is enormous, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a wild, a wild place to be for a couple of years, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. How did you how did you get the nickname Audio Wade? Where did that come from? Yeah, so I got the job when um, they just had an an opening for a sound guy. So I I got in there. Um, a, a buddy of mine uh, named Ben had done some work for them, had done some kind of freelance stuff for them. Um, and then, yeah, so I, I got in there pretty quickly and then was the sound guy. They needed a nickname and audio. They, Steven said it sounded something like audio slave or audio wave. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm not an audio slave fan, but yeah, I, I got got dubbed audio wave, however that uh, worked out. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm forever labeled the guy who knows stuff about sound. So I guess yeah. that's, <laughs> I guess that works. Did you go to school for sound? Was your degree in like communications broadcasting or where did, where did no? That... So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I I went to a little school in Arkansas and studied theology, and uh, but really all of my audio experience was live audio and recording. So I recorded music and things like that. But but yeah, I really had never done anything. I, the the live audio that I had done has had been bands had been like uh, doing sound for worship services and things like that. Um, so yeah. Sk- you know, mixing four or five voices was pretty well scaled down from doing a full worship set. So yeah, it was, it was a good opportunity though. That's great. Did you grow up in the church? Did you grow up in a believing household or what, what is that background? Yeah, I did. My, my dad is a worship guy at a church, uh, and was my whole life. So I, we, we moved around a little bit. Uh, we were in the Southern Baptist convention and, um, yeah, love, loved our, the opportunity of growing up in a ministry home, and uh, yeah, I was really blessed with faithful parents and, and people who uh, loved God and trusted God and, and set that pattern for me very early. That's wonderful. Uh, public school, homeschool, private school. Are you, are Pu- you yeah. all or? Yeah, public school. All, all uh, I guess the first 12 years, 13 years. So kindergarten through 12th grade, public school. I was, uh, I was a regular heathen. But yeah, I, I got I got 13 years of the stuff, went to a small Christian college and uh, for, for college and then did a little bit of uh, seminary at RTS Orlando. And uh, yeah, so that's my that's my educational resume. OK, nice. Awesome. Yeah. So what brought you to Canon Press? Well, um, so I I was aware of kind of the rumblings, what was going on up here in Idaho. I, I had I read um, I read Rules for Reformers and A Serrated Edge. Um, I think, I think in 2016 or so, and that was around the time that I, I, I grew up sort of wanting to do, um, I, 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 well, I was, I was planning on being in ministry. That's what I, that's what I was uh, planning on doing, being in worship ministry. Um, but actually there was a time where I couldn't even get a job there just from lack of being able to, like, I, I, I tried to work in a different places. Um, this is starting to, to sound scrambled, but when, when I was younger, one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to write for David Letterman. I wanted to write for like Conan O'Brien, Saturday Night Live. I wanted to be in the late night comedy world. Um, and um, and so what I uh, remind, remind me what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> what got you to Canon Press? I'm headed. So, yeah, I'm headed there. I'm headed. 
So, um, so when I, when I read, uh, thank you, I appreciate the, the redirection. <laughs> um, so I, I read a serrated edge because it was a book about satire, you know, it was a book about how to write, uh, the, the kind of biblical justification for writing, uh, stuff that's cutting and stuff that, um, that has an edge to it, serrated edge and, uh, rules for reformers, same kind of thing. Rules for reformers has a whole section in it called rules for a godly satirist. Um, but that was, I, I, when I was writing comedy at the Crowder show, which is, which was most of my job, most of what I did there for most of the time. Um, when I was doing that, I had to actually consider a lot of ways that I could have done that wrong. Cause I, I found myself having to make a bunch of calls. You know, I have to make calls as to whether this joke or that joke is okay. Um, and I always wanted to do that with a, a kind of a foundation that was moral, that was consistent with my faith, consistent with honoring God um, and me memorizing a handful of the rules for a godly satirist was a big deal for me. So so I I'm a I've been a Doug Wilson fan. I've been a Canon Press fan uh, from afar for a long time and have gotten a lot of value from the things that are coming out here. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, uh, I had, a, I have a friend named Jake McAtee. Jake McAtee, uh, was, um, he's from Texas, came down to visit, uh, over Christmas and a couple of times, uh, just came and visited, talked to me, eventually convinced me to apply Canon. So, so yeah, I was, I was, uh, I've been aware of Canon for a long time, loved Canon, loved, uh, and still am amazed that I get to um, do some of the things that I'm able to do here and, uh, help, help with the growth process. But so, so that so the long story is I've been headed toward Canon for a long time. Short version of it is Jake McAtee visited my house and convinced me to. <laughs> that's awesome. great. That's I great. love the trail all the way around. That's, yeah, that's yeah. I I, I, pre I I appreciate your patience with that whole this, uh, roundabout trip. This is a long form podcast uh, most of the time, so feel free to <laughs> expound, extrapolate wherever you right. want. R ramble. <laughs> Yeah, nice exactly. words for it. Yeah. <laughs> we actually got to meet Jake uh back in September at the Fight Left. Very cool. Conference. So we got to spend Very a little cool. bit of time at the uh at, at the table there, which was a lot of fun. That's awesome. Yeah, I love Jake. Host of the Cannon Calls podcast. If you're not yes. subscribed, yep, yep. Listen and to we've listened Calls. to the uh and we've listened to yeah. Your episode on there that you got. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Recorded yes. in this very uh cave. Is that <laughs> so this is the yeah. Is that the box that Jake McAtee the, told me about? Is yes, that is, this that, is that the it? box? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, the box, the the, the, the box fable box. But up. we so it's a cannon right there. We're sitting in the middle of it. The call's breaking up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Okay, um, you're, yeah, you're back. Any better now? Okay, yeah. sorry about that. So yes, this is the box. Uh, I'm sitting in the front part of the cannon offices right now, and surrounded by foam. And yeah, it's it's an odd little little spot. I probably look like I'm in a cave with a window in it, but yeah, it's it's a sound booth. It looks, awesome. yeah, that's very great. It looks like you're in a dark room. I mean, there's literally, it's just black right now. <laughs> and then there's yeah, that, with this there's dramatic like, light here. Door there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Right. I feel like I'm about to like read a poem or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, you know, know. okay, so that, oh, man, you just fly right into this. So <laughs> that goes in line, I think, a little bit with what you're doing at Canon, right? So tell yeah, us yeah. your role, your title. You don't just have to tell us the title, but what exactly is your role and what you're doing there? Are you still Absolutely. Audio, right? Yeah, are you still I... <laughs> That's the question. Yeah. Well, in a lot of ways, yeah. So I, um, I, a lot of stuff that I do is in the audio realm. So I, I work on the audio book side of things. Um, I've read a handful of books since I've been here and had the opportunity. I've done it here. So um, been able to do that, been able to be the voice of some really cool books. So books by Greg Bonson, books by Doug Wilson, books by uh, Jim Wilson, um, Gary DeMar. So a lot of, a lot of really cool um, things that I've been able to um kind of get to people. I think a lot of, I, I listen to probably as many books as I read nowadays. So it's cool to be able to translate some of these things into ways that people are just more convenient, more convenient for some people to listen to. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm in the audio world. Uh, I work with another guy, uh, his name's Caleb, who does all the audio editing. Um, and so that's the audio side of things. I do some stuff with the app. So keeping things fresh there, uh, Canon Plus, mycanonplus.com, check that out. Um, 
and uh, and a lot of the stuff with YouTube. So I, I, I manage the kind of YouTube presence for Blog MA Blog, for Canon Press, and for the new Jared Longshore channel. Um, so a lot of lot of content. I think uh, Doug has recently posted something about there being a big torrent of content coming out of Canon, and uh, it's been fun to be able to facilitate that and and kind of be able to manage that growth. And, and it's been it's been cool to see. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I do audio books myself and voiceover cool. and stuff like that. Uh, well, what's interesting is, so like you also did the book, I'm, I'm making my way through E. Michael Jones, Monster yeah. of the Id, and it's, fa- it's a fabulous book, uh, yeah. but it's a 17 hour audio book. And I know from <laughs> personal experience that that's yeah. not just 17 hours of work. You're triple, quadruple that time, right? I mean, how long, right. yeah. how long did that book take you to slog through and to do the audio? Yeah. Well, I think. I think, like I said, Caleb is the guy here who does a lot of the audio editing, all of the audio editing, really. And he said that it was about 30 hours of recorded audio and 60 hours of his time to edit it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it was wild. But I, I was able to, you know, I, I learned so much in the reading of that. I, I had read that once before and was already a fan of it. And, and again, yeah. just uh, like you said, fascinating stuff, the history behind it all. And uh, literary criticism the, for for those listening, the Monsters from the Id by E. Michael Jones. Uh, it's a biography of horror, so it's the it's the kind of the story of the horror genre, um, told through the eyes of the people or about through the lives of the people who made it and shaped it. Fascinating stuff, all the way from Mary Shelley into 1990s Hollywood, with sp- some specific examples. Um, so yeah, that was you know it was 30 hours of happy work. I was I was thrilled to be able to just. Um, just kind of sit at the fount of E. Michael Jones for, for all that time. Oh yeah. That's absolutely wonderful. Do you speak yeah. French? There's a lot of uh, French, idioms, <laughs> and lots of things. I mean, it's really, yeah. you, you did, you did great. Cause you didn't just slog through the book. <laughs> you also had to do some phrases that were in different languages, particularly French yeah. stuff. Were you yeah. Well, that was all, that, that was all fake. So I'm glad it came off <laughs> as, as working out. So yeah, I just, what I figured out was as long as I pronounce it the same way, every time, it'll be okay. okay. And people will be, people will be faked out pretty well. So, and yeah. it worked. I'm, I'm glad hey, that it worked at some level. I'm in the business and I'm totally convinced. So good, good job there. Audio <laughs> with, with confidence and the same thing every time it worked. Absolutely. That was great, man. <laughs> yeah. That's good. You know, particularly that book, uh, you know, I'm about mm, a fourth, uh, about a third of the way through. And, uh, okay. I, but I must say, I, I read the horror books growing up. A lot of them, Frankenstein yeah. particularly, I'll never read it again the same. You know, that right. background, that history that Jones hits. I mean, it totally. is, uh, it's, it's so profound with, mm-hmm. the, with, with the ways in which, oh, well, this actually came from the sexual revolution or the French mm-hmm. revolution. Yeah. Uh, that's really where the horror genre originates from. It's really, right. that book is fascinating. Yeah. And it's the kind of thing where it, you know, it start it makes you start thinking about other genres too, and thinking through why do people need this genre? So this, the, the horror genre, the, to summarize the thesis is the return of the repressed. It's the, uh, the monster represents this suppressed um, morality, the suppressed conscience and coming back to haunt you. Um, and that's the case in Frankenstein. Anyway, and then then it makes you start to think about other genres and why why those things are popular and what it says about the psychology of the people who love those things. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a huge book, huge implications, and you know it's an academic book and can be kind of intimidating. But I don't I you let me know what you think. I, I don't think it's the kind of thing that most people would be intimidated by. It, it doesn't read. It's not it's not a it's not a tough read, but it is dense and and full. No, but with your melodious pipes in the background <laughs> through it it's, it's it's perfectly fine well that's very kind of you to say <laughs> flattery is a sin so i really mean that by the way <laughs> like i said very kind very thank you so much what are the other genres that you've pondered do you have any tidbits you could give us there yeah i mean i i think um i think just thinking about like music uh for one uh when people listen to uh certain things that are you know, the kind of people talk about teenage angst and listening to teenage angst music. Um, I actually s- something similar with with horror, with like crime fiction or kind of dark fiction. It tends to be the it, um, I think Nate Wilson has actually made a similar point where it tends to be people who don't have a lot of trouble in their lives that try to bring in the kind of fictional trouble to kind of make up for that. Um and it's it's similar it's similar to how you know like 
I, I made a I made a video a while back on my YouTube channel called Why Celebrities Dressed Like Bums. Yeah. So it's it's a video, it's a video basically about how these are people who don't have any real interaction with the world as it actually is. Um, and so they will dress up like people who are in trouble. <laughs> They'll dress up like people who are who are actually having real experience with the world people who they, like so that's why these crazy rich people who will never be in trouble um dress like meth addicts and dress like losers be like people dress like people on the side of the road it's because they they envy that they're, they're they kind of just want this this real experience and they they feel guilty for even just living a life that doesn't have that that doesn't have real interaction um so yeah, I, I think I think that it's 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 related in that way. For some for some reason, my connection between E. Michael Jones. Thank you again for your patience with my roundabout connections. But the, E. Michael Jones being being reading horror and going ah yes, this is exactly what I needed has a very similar thing to wearing a shirt that's all torn up and just looking like I, I saw a recent clip of Jonah Hill on the Tonight Show and he looks like a beach bum with like sun bleached hair. It's like it looked like he got it. He probably paid hundreds of dollars yeah. to make his hair look like it was bleached by the sun and he'd been sleeping outside, um, <laughs> which is just a sad, sad thing. But it also just goes like that's a tortured guy. That's a guy who is he, he's like he wants to look like he's in trouble, probably because spiritually he knows he is. Um, yeah. And so. So, yeah, it's 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 the kind of book, like I said, that just makes you think about a bunch of other things differently. And I'm, I'm sure that you've probably experienced the same thing as you're listening. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Um, tell us a little bit more, kind of going back to Canon specifically, um, really? not just your work there, but I mean, some of our audience, I think, is familiar with Canon, of course. We love the mm -hmm. app. We have it. We use it. It's, it, I don't want to say it's uh, uh, um, revolutionized our life. I would say it's reformed our life in, in, oh, there we in, go. in a lot of ways by the content, um, because there's cool. so much good content on there. And frankly, um, you know, I mean, we're not an affiliate or anything with you guys, but we'd love to help sell the soap as it were. So please tell, yeah. tell us, tell us about Canon. Um, you know, give us uh, any background history of it. If somebody doesn't know about Canon, if they're listening, going, what is it? What's this app? Um, why is it better than Netflix? <laughs> well, Canon Press uh, started in the 1980s as a ministry of a church up here in Moscow, Idaho. So Christ Church is the name of the church, and uh, Canon Press started as a ministry there. Uh, a few years ago, um, it was so it was converted from a ministry into a business. So it was it was a nonprofit, uh, and then th then they switched it over to a uh, business. Let's sell the books as a as an actual publisher, um, and so. So really, that transition has meant uh, kind of opening up of the gates of what Canon means. So Canon Press, publisher of Christian books, publisher, it, it started out to essentially gather up the wealth of writing that was already happening here and happening through books and be able to get those out to people as, as much as possible. And then so started small and then now... Um, has has grown to the point where we have tons of audio content, tons of video content, um, and the uh, and tons of print content as well. So it's it's kind of grown and evolved from a publishing company into a kind of publishing media world, uh, kind of in all of those spaces, which is a really fun place to be. I think that um, right now, obviously, a lot of stuff is moving digital. So we have we have the app, and so the the app uh, we actually just launched Canon Plus which is a kind of new iteration of the app. It's web-based and it will also have, um, have phone app capabilities as well in the coming, uh, coming weeks. But um, that is a collection of all of our audio content, all of our audio books, all audio lectures on stuff from theology to history, to family, um, to culture, to, um, yeah, goodness. It, it really is our, our one of our mottos, one of our ways, the ways that we talk about ourselves is all of Christ for all of life. So really, as I, I have all, as, out of this window right here, I can see every book that Canon Press prints. Uh, oh, so it's got so it's all it's, it's all just sitting around. Um, and so it's kind of wild just to walk through and see the breadth of work that's being done here. Yeah. Um, and just to, and, and all of it done with a goal toward helping people, equipping people. Um, to do the work of reformation in their homes all the way up to in politics um, and in their churches. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a real privilege to be a part of this because it really is a kind of full-orbed um, worldview-based 
publisher. No. But then also uh, wh why the Canon app exists is to be able to carry that in to uh, to make that accessible, make it more accessible and also to be able to um, right right now, the, the Canon, Canon Plus has been developed totally outside of big tech. So it doesn't use anybody else's servers. It doesn't use um, other people's uh, sort of back end. So we, we were working with another company. Now we have our own entire structure top to bottom and it's the kind of thing that uh really could be could make us and could make other people uncancelable um so supporting supporting canon plus is really supporting i think what i think is the next generation of streamers the next generation of people who want to have subscription services but may not be able to like we were able to build our own structure we were able to build our own infrastructure for all of that stuff not everybody's going to be able to do that, but some, but some people will be able to kind of sign on. And, and so, like I said, supporting, supporting Canon plus you get, a, you get a ton of content, you get a ton of value. You, you said it's been able to reform, revolutionize, you know, your, your life. And then same, same with me. Um, but it also means that other publishers, other content creators and other, um, authors will be able to, um, grow, will be able to kind of carry their stuff into the next generation without being canceled, without threats from big tech. Um, so really the Canon app and Canon, Pl Canon, Canon Plus, Canon Press, um, all of that the, is really a future oriented, but also very much an earthy and um, realistic approach to bringing Christ to every area of life. Um, I, I, I studied under John Frame when I was at RTS Orlando and he, he defines theology as the application of scripture by persons to every area of life. Mm -hmm. um, and so theology really, and, and, and another, like what Doug, what Doug Wilson says is uh, that theology comes at your fingertips and whatever comes at your fingertips is your theology. Um, and so you could, you could categorize all of these things as being theology and practical theology. Um, but really it's about life and it's about applying, it's about bringing, the truth of scripture to things that may not seem like scripture really touches on um, raising kids, but it does. And, and taking those things and, and, and again, trying, hoping that it does reform uh, the way that you think about everyday life. Yeah, definitely. And it seems like there's constantly new content. Um, totally. On the app. Like yeah. you, you can't hardly keep up with the way that you guys are putting new stuff on there, which is awesome. Do you have like a cadence for how many new things are on there a day or a week? Or does that ebb and flow? Yeah. So we, we try to shoot for two releases a week. Um, and uh, but what, what we're actually moving, that's that's kind of been the model that we've done in the past. What we're moving toward now is doing at least one audiobook release per week. Mm. So, uh, so that's, that's the goal for 2022 is to have 52 audiobook releases. Uh, we're going to try to try to get those, try to get those recorded, try to get those edited. Uh, but that'll be a really fun way to be able to churn out things and add value to people. Um, like I said, we've got a ton of things printed, ton of things on the shelf right outside this window, but a lot of that stuff isn't translated into a way that's very easy to, for people to grab. And so, mm -hmm. Um, as you said, you, you may, you may not pick up the E. Michael Jones book and, and I, I, in the same way, um, I, I've, I've been able to listen to some stuff on the Canon app and then go, you know what, I'm going to buy two copies of that for my friends. You know, yep. um, plot activity was like that for me. Yes. Um, so yeah, so I, that's, that's the plan. That's the rhythm. And I'm, I'm really excited for people to get their hands on some surprise books, some things that they, uh, so I, I just recently finished up reading, uh, doing the audiobook for Doug Wilson's Excused Absence, uh, his book on it's it, it's called I think Should Christian Kids Leave Public Schools, um, just fascinating, uh, really really good stuff. It's it's one of his early books. Uh, I think uh, Darren Doan, who's up here, has said that it's that it's is the most like fighting kind of uh, tone he takes, which is a lot of fun. So it's great. It's 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 very yeah. It's it's very Doug and it's very um, informative and challenging. It's really yeah. good stuff. I know you worked with a good guy with uh, Steven and everything, man, but now uh, yeah. with Doug, it's just that is a really cool opportunity that you have to be reading his books and pushing this particular material. It, yeah, it totally. really is. It really must be a special opportunity. It really is. I, I So I, I've, like I said, benefited from Doug Wilson for a long time, read, read um, 
a ton of books before moving up here and before, um, you know, before even thinking about moving up here. But, um, but I think that one of the cool things about being able to be around him is just be able to see how normal he is. I think that, um, I, I've talked to my wife about this, that as, as the transition has happened here, I think that I'm, I'm, you know, slowly realizing, um, how much of an uphill battle it is and how much of a, um, how much of sanctification is just getting to being able to act normal. Um, whereas this, like, whereas sin just slows you down so much and it just gets in the way of real human interaction. Uh, and really, um, I think CS Lewis in that hideous strength talks about, um, I think there's there's one character that sees another character and how he sits in a chair yeah and how he it's almost it's it, he he envies the way that guy sits in a chair because <laughs> that guy just sits in a chair so normally and without being in his head and without thinking about how people are thinking of him um but yeah that that's been a real blessing to be around like Doug is the kind of guy who really is just a normal guy and then I realize just being in the presence of a normal person, yeah. I realize how crazy I am and how much yeah. I'm held back by by my little my my little um yeah, like I said, just little strange things that are firing off in my head, but just he like and, and that that is the kind of um almost a practical encouragement and conviction and sanctification that urges me on into just being able to sit in a chair and <laughs> just live normal life. Um, and that's, and that that's the goal. The goal is a normal family. The goal yes. is, is normal parenting and normal kids and like a, a normal church service with a normal Sunday lunch afterward, um, where you can actually enjoy it and be happy. Yeah. Um, and that's, 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 that's what I think, uh, what I've learned about sanctification since, since being here is that it really is growing up into being a normal person. Yes. Yes. That's very yeah. well put. Thank I you. I really like that. Yeah. yeah. Of all the books, do you have a favorite Canon Press book and or favorite Doug Wilson book specifically? If they're two different, that, that's fine. That is, that's very tough. I, <laughs> so I have, um, Rules for Formers, I've read probably more than any other. Um, so I read, I, like I said, the, the Rules for a Godly Satirist, um, the, the, the story really quickly behind that was that Doug wrote a serrated edge and John frame, whom I admire a ton uh, and have learned a lot from and was able to uh, learn from at RTS. He wrote a review of, of, of a serrated edge with some cautions saying uh, yes, we, uh, it's a good idea to do satire. Maybe with some uh, maybe you should list out all of the ways that uh, m maybe Doug, you should list out all of the ways that a godly satirist should guard his heart and guard uh, his art as he's doing that. And uh, so Doug did. He wrote a whole response on his blog, and then that was imported then into Rules for Reformers. So, um, like I said, in, in show and in being a, a person who's on the show trying to be funny, you know, back when I was at Cr the Crowder Show, and then what I'm able to do now. Um, those rules have been just ingrained in me. Just the way, the way that I, I, you know, the way that you're supposed to actually handle, uh, the, the kind of person who can do battle with words is a, is actually an aspirational thing. It's not just, uh, it's not just being cute. It's not just being haphazard or throwing out, like throwing out jokes just cause you think they're funny, but actually doing something with a purpose and doing something with, uh, accountability and with uh, love in your heart for the people that you're uh, satirizing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, rules for reformers, a serrated edge probably are are you know up there. Um, another one that I I think um, I, I'm I'm listing more than one Doug Wilson book here. That's but, okay. Uh, <laughs> That's all right. We would, we would too. <laughs> <laughs> There's there's one there's one book of his called Empires of Dirt uh, that I think doesn't get the attention it deserves. It's so good. Um, it has a whole section in there about two kingdoms. Subtitle of that is um, Secularism, Radical Islam, and the Mere Christendom Alternative. Um, so it goes into like why secularism is this void and that secularism thinks that it can live as itself for a long time, but really it is a void and that uh, radical Islam comes in and tries to fill that void. But the only true 
thing that can fill that cultural void, that political void, is a sense of mere Christendom. So that and that book gives a model for what that's supposed to look like. So good, Empires of Dirt. Um, and one that's not a Doug book that I really, really love is Toby Sumter's book, Blood Bot World. Mm. Um, I love that book. So that's there's I I wish I wish I could remember some specific quotes from it, but right now the only thing that I remember from it is um the illustrations by Forrest Dickinson in there. And it's it's this um so it, the the chapters are laid out uh kind of the chapters are laid out with these images at the top. So the first one is a picture of a cow, and the second one is a picture of a golden calf, and the third one is a picture of a like of a slaughtered cow <laughs> and then so and then after that it's a steak on a grill so so it's this it's this great kind of picture of what people do and what idolatry looks like and what the response to idolatry is and it's and that once you're able once you kind of cut down the idols once you once you're able to slaughter the cow then you can actually cook it and eat it mm. uh, and it's a benefit it's a benefit to you so um i yeah i think it's isaiah that talks about the about you know, you, you cut you cut a piece of wood in half and half of it's your God and half of it's your firewood. Um, like that's, that's what idol that's what the, uh, idol makers did. Yeah. And that, um, that really, if you were able to stop worshiping this thing, you could actually use it. You could actually use it for firewood. Um, and so that's, that's, uh, that may not even be the thesis of Bloodbot world, but it's for some reason my takeaway from it. Yeah. Um, his, the, with the beautiful illustrations being the, the kind of, sticky part that hangs out in my mind but i love that book i it really it really is tough to pick because i've again just va- taken so much value from what, what goes on up here that's good i don't know if you mentioned it or not but regarding doug's blog do you help out with those videos obviously i've seen we've seen you do the questions of course but yes do you yeah the scene stuff too with with that some of it some of it yeah so what what i part, part of what i'm doing here is kind of brand managing on youtube so the um the kind of the look of Mayblog and the sorry I bumped the mic, but the look of Mayblog and the and getting those out to people and kind of establishing what the thumbnails are going to look like and kind of um, what what people how how to sell Mayblog to folks has been a really fun process because it was when I got here it wasn't video and it was just uh, Doug reading the audio podcast. Um, but we figured out, you know what, it takes exactly the same amount of time for him to read it as it does for him, us to film it and him read it. Um, and so we just, we just set up a camera, decided to uh, make it a video show and that's been able to, that's, that's really gone far. Uh, oh, yeah. blog and may blog is a channel that's just grown in immense ways. And it's been actually a really fun front door for people. I think that's, that's, that may be one of my favorite parts of what I've been able to do is give people new front doors into what's been going on here for decades um so that somebody might be able to watch a five minute video or a 10 minute video from doug get some value from it and then subscribe and then read one of his books that was written before they were born uh and and that's 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 the kind of journey that i think i've been able to watch people go on so they like they'll comment there and, and there are people who comment and there are people who don't but the um even just reading the people who do comment uh, it's fun to see, like I said, just how how much people have talked about like, oh, man, I, I wish I could have put this stuff into words. But now that I found blog and may blog, I've, I've been, able to, uh, been able to describe what I've been feeling for a decade or for all this all this time that I've been kind of in a in a woke church. Or I've been, been in a kind of awkward relationship with a friend. And I didn't know how to say it, but now um, now I'm able to and then go all the way to all right, now my entire Christmas list is Canon Press books, you know, Um, (laughs) which, which is, is the case with me. Um, So, so yeah, that, that's, that's been cool. And, and so blog, blog and may blog. um, And if anybody's listening who hasn't subscribed to blog, blog and may blog. Oh yeah. 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 Open a new tab and. uh, Exactly. In fact, stop listening to us. Just go subscribe. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, There we go. (laughs) I didn't want to, I didn't want to be the one to say it. You shouldn't be the one to say it, but we'll say it for you. There there we go. Your show, your show. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's great. Okay. So tell us a little bit about, um, about your YouTube channel. I feel like it's these, if I may say it's like micro truths because they're, most of them are not very long. They're three minutes, sometimes five minutes. They're not very long, but man, you're poignant. You hit points and you do a great job with just being concise and quick. 
and just right on the money, as it were. I mean, I, I really enjoy your channel and uh, the stuff that you're doing over there. Are you trying to hit like one video a week or what is your um, what is your rhythm? Yeah, so typically I uh, I do it on Saturday. So I'll film it in the morning, edit it and get it out hopefully by noon and then spend the rest of the day with my family. So that's kind of my schedule. And it is it is an opportunity, I think, for me to write something every week, to have an obligation where I have just decided I'm going to do it every week. It may not be the thing that people remember me for, <laughs> but it's 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 a, more of a discipline thing for me. Um, and and discipline in consistency, but also in content. Um, as you can tell by, you know, this, how this interview is going, I am not very good at being able to summarize my thoughts very quickly. Um, and so being able to do that in two and three minutes, uh, has been a challenge for me and trying to take the things that have been the, the insights that I think that I've heard from people that have been spread over the course of many, many books and trying to patch those together and, and give those to, my audience and my audience, from what I can tell, is mainly kind of conservative right wingers uh, who are sort of upset about the news. Um, and that's and that's that's the kind of commonality there. That's but within that group, there's a ton of different individual people who have different questions and, and want different things and love different things and have different hobbies and have, have thought about these things at various levels. So um Sometimes I'll talk about stuff that I've learned from Greg Bonson or from Van Til and try to, you know, go into the real theology nerd thing, but not do it with the terms, not do it with anything that is, you know, like I, I don't I don't have an exact syllable limit in, in the words that I'm using, but I, I, I don't want I don't want anybody to walk away. I want the people to walk away from those videos with a little more clarity and not less clarity. I don't want people to be clouded uh, after those. So so the real yeah, the real goal for those is. First and foremost, I, I said it was a consistency thing for me, and I said it was a, a, a kind of concision thing for me, but primarily, and and pr primarily, it was for the audience. I, I saw a sort of uh, tendency among the folks that listen to me, that read my tweets and things like that, um, that is sort of just reactive, um, and and I think that's a, a gen general thing on the right politically, the political yeah. right. And the political left both do have a tendency to uh, see something on the news, be upset about it and think that their job is done. And and I think that that's I think that's kind of sad. I think that's kind of uh, um, I, I I've been there. I know what that's like. And I also know that if I was just mad about the news, I would be really tough to be around. Uh, my wife wouldn't want to talk to me. You know, uh, my kids would go like, what's up with dad? Um, so it's, I don't I don't want that to happen. And so I recognize that it's it is the kind of thing where um, what I want to do is challenge people to um, see the news and respond with hope, respond with a plan, and uh, to not just just to not be so down. I think I think I think that the right can get pretty down, and I think that as Christians we actually are we. Uh, we are called, we are told to be joyful. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Yeah. And so um, you can really, it sometimes can feel like anger is our strength uh, where the right, the right may think that the best thing that they can do is rant about something. Uh, yeah. The best thing that they can do is, ha you know, be able to really, really, you know, hit off a bunch of one liners and, and really knock down the world. Um, but it, if, if in the end you don't have any hope and if in the end, you've really knocked down the world, but you don't have anything to replace it with, or you yeah. don't have a plan or you don't have any kind of real lasting joy. That's devastating. And yeah. you're, and you're like, it, it's devastating to you as a person individually, but it also is devastating to the people around you who are looking to you for guidance and hope. Um, which is, like I said, I, I, I see that with my, my wife and kids. I, I, I want to be a person who is hopeful and a person who plans and a person who isn't reactive be, for their sake, uh, not just for my own. And, uh, and yeah, I, I think that that's, that's kind of the, the tack that I've, I've tried to take with the YouTube channel is just a kind of hopeful planning. Uh, don't be surprised at the news. Don't run, you know, don't run around with your hair on fire. Um, <laughs> it's going to be okay. Not because I say so. And not because I'm not because I'm just naturally very cheery. Cause I'm not, I'm not this, you know, Pollyanna kid. Um, but because, I trust God and you can, and you actually 
there's real peace that comes from that. Wow. Um, even though interacting with some real darkness and, and you can, yes. you can go all the way down. It's, the, um, I think there's, there's a lot of fear that, well, if things get really, really dark, I'll lose my hope by some kind of law. Like, of course, of course I lost my hope. Things are that bad. Um, but really you have a decision to make whether to trust God or not. Um, and I, I, you know, it's one of the verses that I'm, I'm having my four-year-old memorize, which is uh, what time I am afraid I will trust in thee. Uh, and so the response to fear is trust. And that that can be something that is, um, just an automatic reaction. So yeah, that's a long answer to a short question. You asked about why I'm so precise, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, honestly, the, the vision there is really to serve people and to, um, try to give people. Uh, a, a place where they know that it's not just going to be another guy who's mad about the news. Yes. Um, and I understand being mad about the news. I get it. It, it, it makes me mad. There's, there's a kind of, there's an anger that's a righteous kind of anger. Um, but I think that equating anger with righteousness is the problem that we have um, on the right and the left. It's just a human thing. Um, we, we, we love being mad. Yes, we do. I love the yeah. balance that Doug brings uh, often when he talks about to we need to pray for our leaders. A lot of them are our mm -hmm. enemies, but we can pray that our enemies become our friends through the power yeah. of the gospel. And we can pray yeah. the imprecatory prayers too. our heart should not be, yeah. oh, we want to just, you know, take them out and just destroy them. It's, hey, no, first, Lord, if you can save them by the power of your gospel, we know you have the power to do so. Um, yeah. and, and that is a reality as a Christian right. that we, we know can happen. We, we do serve a God who can do all things. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, I, 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 I've been in that place too, where it's very easy to be angry at the news and look at the news as sort of the, the hope or the balm. Uh, and right. then sometimes when your candidate doesn't win or you feel cheated or things go down, it, it, it seems as if the whole world might come to an end. And yet in the end, Jesus Christ is King. And I think setting our hopes on him and his kingdom and his kingdom down here on this earth as well as we take dominion. Um, I think that that is uh, very important for us to remember as Christians. So no, that's yeah. a, that's a great point. And I, and I, I see that on your YouTube channel. I see that you're exemplifying that. And I really Thank hope you. that more people are inspired to do those types of things. If it's YouTube or if it's through some other form or medium or books or blogs or whatever, it's like, we need more people who are around our age group. I think, speaking wisdom into the culture yeah. and on the platforms that are run by the uh commie networks <laughs> <laughs> well thank you yeah it's 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 really um it's been a privilege and a pleasure to um like i said just hear from the the way people are responding to it and seeing seeing the good uh that it is doing um i, I think that i think that like i was saying earlier um folks folks are looking for hope. I think they are looking for some, uh, some kind of s steady head, you know, some, somebody who has uh, a, an even keeled temperament and that because that is so rare, uh, I, I, I don't, I can't name many media personalities. I, I can't name many politicians. Um, most media personalities and politicians make their living from not being even keeled. Um, and it's the kind of, um, I like you, you, you read stories about martyrs and you read, you hear about their last words. You know, it's like the you, they've re people have recorded their last words as they're being burned yeah. and you go, I wouldn't have the presence of mind to do anything, but go, ah, you know? yeah, right, <laughs> that's all exactly. I would do. like, but they've got this beautiful speech, you know? And I, 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 it's like, that's a guy that's, or, or a gal who is, um, who's just has the presence of mind to know why they're doing what they're doing and to just suffer and with a smile on their face, knowing that there's some kind of point. Um, and I think that that's, if, if somebody can do that with, when, with the ultimate tests of life, um, then I can do that with smaller tests like, oh, I just read a sad thing on Twitter. Yeah. Um, those, I, if, if we, if, you know, I, um, we had Glenn Sunshine here who wrote a great book called Slaying Leviathan about Protestant resistance theory. Great book, great book. Um, and we did an interview with him and I think it's going to be coming out soon. One of the questions I wanted to ask him was um, he talks a lot about resistance and a lot about the history of it and with the development of Protestant resistance thought and Christian resistance and, and a lot of things that we 
right now really want to know about. Um, we, um, uh, and, and what I, what I wanted to know, what I wanted to ask was what kind of person does it take to put up a Christian resistance, like a distinctively Christian looking resistance, not just is resistance. Okay. I can justify my hot temper. Uh, great. Awesome. I I'm a hot tempered guy. And now that I've read Glenn Sunshine's book, I can go do whatever I want. Um, and it's like, that's not what he means. That's not what he wants. But like, what does it take to be the kind of person who does put up um, the uh, a, a Christian resistance to tyranny um, while also being, a you know, it, it, I, so anyway, that, that was a, I, I think that um, I actually wasn't in the room when he answered that question. I wrote down the questions and somebody else did the interview. So keep an eye on the Canada Press YouTube channel uh, yeah, to hear Glenn Sunshine's answer to that uh, to that question to that great question. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that was a. Um, but I I think that that's I think that is the key point. I think it is that um, we we do a lot of times we want to search like what is you know we search YouTube for is resistance okay resistance to government and then they you find the videos that again will kind of justify the thing you already wanted to do. Right. Um, which was be angry <laughs> and kind of lash out. Um, but but really, it's it's the, the people who put up a, a what I believe was a Christian resistance in the uh, the founding times so during during the um, you know, you can call it the founding. Uh, but like during the, the war for independence, like those those were different kinds of people. And I don't know how many of those people we have now. Yeah. Um, and the, and the way that we are going to be able to put up a Christian resistance is by being Christians. Um, it's not that, it's not that we can put up, we can't put up a Christian resistance if we are holding on to pet sins and to anger issues and, um, and lashing out. I'm, I'm sure, you know, the, the, Revo the, uh, you know, the revolutionary war was, was a mixed group. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't just one, uh, core group, but the people who were leading it, people like Patrick Henry were real Christian people who were making real Christian decisions mm -hmm. um, with with love in their hearts for their families and for their homes, um, not just being triggered. You know, Patrick Henry was not a guy who could be triggered. He yeah. was just a guy who was who was, you know, actually concerned with the issues and with the people involved and loved his people, uh, loved his country. And, and most of all, yeah, is loved his family. Um, anyway, Patrick Henry's great, uh, but, yeah. but specifically, specifically the Christian, like if, if we're going to put up a Christian resistance, it's going to take a lot of internal work, um, in, in our hearts, in our families and learning how to confess our sins. Uh, if I'm, if I'm going to, I, I can put up a hot headed temperamental resistance, um, all in the flesh, right? I can do that just all on my own. Yeah. But if I, if I'm in practice apologizing to my kids, if I over, if I overreact at the table, you know, if I bite their head off at the table, apologizing to my kids, then I've had, I've had to go through some humility training <laughs> where if somebody's yelling at me, I'm not, I'm not seething in the same way that I would be if I would, if I hadn't gone through some kind of based training, Liv living in living among way of acting so yeah i, I think that i think that's going to be that's going to be the test are we the kind of people who can put up a christian resistance are we the, are we christians uh that's that's the the ultimate thing that and that's where it starts there's a reason you asked about canon and um one thing that i love about canon is that it started with marriage books mm -hmm. um that the first books that were here and the books that still sell extremely well are reforming marriage, uh, federal husband, um, the fruit of her hands. Um, and these, these are books that were written in the nineties and some of them in the early two thousands, but these were books that are benefiting me right now. Yeah. And, um, but it's, it's the kind of thing where people think of Doug Wilson, people think of Canon press as being this, uh, culturally engaged, group this culturally engaged publisher and we are um but that that does start with the family it starts with uh, sanctification of individuals and how and fathers and mothers and husbands and wives and how they're interacting with each other and being able to sanctify um those things those those, those things that seem small but they're the the microcosm of you know they are the microcosm yeah. Um, I think that the the last line of 
uh, the promo copy of of uh, standing on the promises is if if Christian culture is not reestablished in countless homes, it won't be reestablished anywhere. Um, and and that's that's the I think the heartbeat, the vision behind what goes on here. It's not just um, let's go fight the bad guys, you know, do like with a let's go Brandon flag in our hands, you know, with like this kind of that that kind of approach. It's it's not just it's not just a let's go fight the bad guys. It's let's be Christians. And so that if there are, you know, once the bad guys are gone in a hundred years, we're still here and we're still building a, what a civilization is made of. And that's made up of a nor like, you know, normal men and normal women and their normal kids. Yes. Um, that, that being the goal, the goal yeah. is just life. Um, it's like in a, in Westerns where it's, where they say like, you may, this, this sheriff makes it safe for women and children to walk around town. Yes, that's that's what that's what we want. We, we're not we're not revolutionaries by temperament. We're not angry by temperament. We don't we don't lash out. What we want is for people to be able to walk around safely in their hometowns. Yeah. Um, and that that's what the vision for Christian resistance is. But Christian resistance with a goal toward just holiness and just life and and normal dinners and the, the way the way people actually work and live. Um, not some politically idealized self, not some kind of, um, not some kind of ideologic chopping obsession person, this kind of caricature of a person, but real people, people with people with lives and people who get tired and need to lay down on the couch at the end of the day and, and listen to some good music and sing with their kids and, um, and, you know, wake up with their kids when they have nightmares, you know, like the, the, that's life. That that's what life feels like. Life doesn't feel like, um, debates on Twitter. And, yes. and, and I think that that's, that's the, um, what, what the, what Canon Press does, what I want to do, the thing that I love about it and why, why I came here, why I'm doing what I'm doing is just a passion for life and a passion for real. Um, I, I'm on the love of life podcast right now. So the, the <laughs> that's kind right. of, You're the, here, man. It's, you a, made it. it's a, yeah, there we go. It's, it's a passion for real everyday righteousness and that that's, that's my aim. And I think that that's what I've had to fight for in my own heart. Uh, is not just I need to be able to chop up every atheist argument or chop up every liberal argument, but am I patient? Yes. And a lot of times the answer is no. And I've I've got to learn that, and I've got to come to embrace um, the fruit of the spirit and be more excited about that uh, than I am necessarily about getting our guy in the White House. Yeah. Um, so so that that's that's my vision. That's kind of um, why I do what I do with the YouTube channel, why I do what I do on Twitter and why I love uh, the opportunity to work at Canon Press. Yeah, that's awesome. I was yeah. wondering what the threads were, what was different or the same about where you came from with Ladder with Crowder and now at Canon. It kind of seems like you've explained that and even what you're yeah. doing on Saturdays with your YouTube channel is kind of the bridge between here's this right wing conservative um, movement of people. And then like, here's the gospel and how it applies all the way down. And this is kind of the middle ground between these two things. Um, sure. it's kind of a bringing together with your audience of those things. And then moving towards the thing that lasts moving towards yeah. how we're changed as people, um, from the inside because of what God does and then how that affects the culture, how that affects politics, how that comes out, um, through Christ on the other side. Yeah. Well, I hope so. And I, that, that really is my aim. And, and that's very kind of you to say, but I, and I think that, um, that th so a lot of times when you do listen to, um, kind of interviews about politics or, um, folks who may be trying to stay out of the religion space, or they don't, they, they may have private belief or they may not, or they may not want to upset people who don't, um, those kinds of conversations do tend to kind of hit a wall at a certain point. Um, and because they can't, there's, they can't really talk about, um, where our rights come from they, or, 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 um, why we should, why, why tyranny is a bad thing. Um, other than just talking about how, well, you can't tell me what to do. Okay. Well, why not? You know, well, what's, and, and, you know, it's what, what is, what is wrong with one meaningless blob of chemicals telling another meaningless blob of chemicals what to do? Right. Um, and, and, and the atheist doesn't, the atheist conservative doesn't have an answer for that. Uh, and the atheist libertarian doesn't have an answer for that. If, if, if your principles are just sort of dangling in the air, 
um, they're not going to last. They're the kind of things that don't last through. So it may be the case that we that we have a bunch of libertarian resistance to our current brand, our current brand of tyranny. Um, but then once they're done with that, they won't be able to build a society. They won't have what it takes uh, because they don't know where their own society came from and where their own society came from was hundreds and thousands of years of biblical morality becoming the assumed norm. Um, and, and so I think that that's, that's what I, that's what I feel when I listen to a lot of, um, a lot of political talk is it can, yeah, it can bump up against that wall and that wall is, well, it's awkward to talk about that because we may differ on that. And then, well, if we differ on that, I may actually be saying something about your eternal destiny (laughs) just by bringing up, well, well, where does your sense of law and rights come from? Those are tough questions. And I, and like, they're tough questions because they have real moral implications. Um, and it is heaven and hell. It's not just, and it's not just heaven and hell. It actually is society or no society. It is, uh, it's society or barbarism. It's, and, and society or barbarism is on the way to heaven and on the way to hell. Um, and, and I think that, I think that that's, that's what people are scared of that. Um, I, I wish they weren't. Um, I think was, I think it was a Chesterton quote where he said something about people say you shouldn't talk about politics and religion. What else is there to talk about? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's um, right. and, and I think that a lot of times people talk, try to talk politics without talking religion as if that's the kind of final thing that you, you, you can't go there. That's, that's, uh, wild. But I think that even if you disagree, even if, even for people who have differences, I've enjoyed getting pushback on my channel from people who are like, um, actually you shouldn't, you Christians shouldn't deserve, you don't deserve special treatment just because of X, Y, Z. And and I like that pushback. I think that's kind of fun. I like, I like interacting with it. Cause you know, at least we're at the bottom, you know, at least we're actually where there's no secret thing past the wall that we can't talk about. We're actually talking about the real stuff. Uh, and that is where does this all come from? Why are we even why, why are we fighting for any rights? And once we've established that, then we can actually start building on something. Yes. Um, and and I think that, yeah, so that that's my goal. My goal is to is to draw those connections. And thank you for saying that that's something that's come across because um, it is my passion to actually make help people know where those things that they love come from. Um, Cause people do love their right to be able to go to the shooting range and be able to have guns in their house and be able to protect their family. And those instincts and those impulses don't come from nowhere. And they don't come and they definitely don't come from a worldview that says everything is meaningless and your loved ones are meaningless and your gun is meaningless and you're meaningless. And the person who's a threat to your family is meaningless. So we're all like, you can't start, you can't decide arbitrarily to start drawing distinctions between this guy is a threat to me. Therefore that's bad there. You know, um, whereas, whereas if you actually have a God, if you actually have a person who created the world and defines everything, defines what's good and what's bad, what, uh, what the righteous response is, and that you can actually take those, unless you have the ability to have those standards come from God, come from God's word. And people have tried to sub in other things, but like I said, it just, it just slows everybody down. It just, uh, whereas once, once we get on that same page, I, th- I really think that we can start building stuff. Um, so it's not, it's not just a, like, uh, a, a an attitude that says I'm, I'm right. I'm going to uh, beat you over the head with this. It really is our only hope, um, in life and in death. Right. And, and so it's not, it's not just, um, standing, it's not just standing on the street. It's like, I wish there were street preachers who would also mention, who would mention heaven and hell and would also mention, and you'll have no hope if you, if you don't go this way anyway, either there's, there's no hope, there's no life, there's no standards, there's no, uh, love. And, and like you lose all of that. And there are street preachers who do that. So I, I'm not, I'm not saying that there aren't, um, <laughs> I've been able to uh, see see some street preachers who, who do that, and I think that that's just extremely effective. There's a there's there's um there's a lot that conservatives take for granted um, that was given to them by people who believe different things from them, and um it would be uh I think it would be in their best interest to listen, uh, even if they wind up not liking that all of their ideas come from the Bible, they should at least know that that's the case. Right. 
Right. Gosh, it would be yeah. so great if there was a publisher that was like writing about those right. connections and what oh, those yeah. foundations and yeah. presuppositions right. are. Well, if only. Say, yeah. If <laughs> only, yeah. Yeah. Right. Canapress.com. Yeah. 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 All that to go. say. Yeah. Yeah. There yeah. Go. It's weird because I feel like, I mean, I'm, I've been heavily involved in politics, following it, this, you know, voting, very much involved in politics my entire life. And it hasn't been until the last year or so that I've really realized politics without a foundation is just politics. And it's always just yeah. this right wing, left wing, back and forth, never ending fight. But foundationally, the, we have to go to a deeper truth. We have to mm-hmm. look at God's law, where all of this comes from, the fact that we're made in his image. And I find that, unfortunately, I find a lot of right wing politicians who I agree with ideologically about a lot of things, they just don't go far enough with a lot of yeah. with a lot of their stick with a lot of what they talk about yeah well and and i think that issues yeah totally and and i think that uh, i think that part of that is calculated i think some of that is so it it may be the case that they actually do believe that the only way that we get morality is from god and if we didn't have if we didn't have god then we wouldn't have morality it could be that they believe that but they just have calculated and said i I decide not to talk about that sometimes they don't even know yeah like they, they actually think or, or, you know, they're willingly ignorant of it, that th- they actually may think that um, rights are just things that exist, you know, yes. or they, they try to avoid the endowed by their creator thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and, and, and I think that, yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. It, but, but again, those, those are the kind of folks whom I love and have lots of friends in that and, and have voted for people like that. So, uh, but it's kind of a, just a sentimental attachment to, the way things used to be, maybe in the 1980s, uh, we want to go back to Reagan. Maybe we want to go back to the 50s. Um, but, but that kind of sentimental attachment is something that doesn't last through revolutions. Right. If, if you're if you're actually in, if we're in the middle of what is a revolution, not necessarily from the right side, but not from the right wing. But it is a cultural revolution for sure. But okay. and, and and you can't like let's say we're on the other side when we get to the other side of that. Let's say the right wing has won. Let's say we actually can, you know, women and children can walk around safe. You know, what do we do then? Yeah. What, where do we get our laws? What if the constitution goes away? You know, what if, what if they, what if they take the U S and we have our own little Island over here? Um, where do we start? And the answer to that question is not going to be, um, well, let's vote about it. Yeah. It actually is going to have to, we're actually going to have to go for authority and that authority isn't going to be us. And it also isn't going to be us as a herd. It has to actually come from outside of us so that if it's going to last um, and if it's going to actually be of any benefit to us. Um, I was, I was, I was listening to uh, Deuteronomy today and it was talking about the, the, the person who lies uh, and accuses somebody of something and is lying that the punishment that that person, the punishment that that other person would have gotten is the punishment that goes on that person. And I had just that morning, just this morning, listened to somebody else talking about the Jesse Smollett thing and saying like, well, he lied. He, you know, I, I don't know why I'm not, a, I'm not a, this is what this person was saying. I'm not a vindictive person, but that, that guy deserves jail time, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. but, but it's like this, this guy knows at some level, he has this kind of instinct. He doesn't know where it comes from. But he has this instinct that the guy who lied that wasted a bunch of, you know, government time and wasted a bunch of cop time and and um, deserves something. It's yeah. and it's not just um, it, it actually is some, some kind of actual punishment. Um, and and, you know, it would have sounded hokey. I was it was uh, it was the Jim and Sam shows on, on Sirius XM. Um, it would have sounded strange to have these to go into a room with Jim Norton, who's this like filthy comedian and Sam Roberts who's a radio host and then talk about, well, actually in Deuteronomy, they, they would feel that <laughs> as a big, they would feel that as a big departure, right? They would yeah. think like, what, uh, you know, but it's like, no, actually the thing that you, this like weird instinct that you have, like this person deserves something comes not, it, you know, he probably hasn't read Deuteronomy, but he lives in a world that was built by people who did. And yes. he was, and, he, and, and that's, that's where those assumptions come from. And it's also written on his heart, whether he likes it or not. And, and I think that I think that that is the kind of thing that we have to be able to say out loud um, and not be embarrassed by. 
as Christians. If Christians are embarrassed by the Bible, then why would anybody else want to read it? <laughs> um, right. Yeah, because because we if we we have to believe it unashamedly, uh, even the awkward parts, um, because that's like the, if if we're going to have a society in a hundred years, we have to believe all the awkward parts of the Bible, things that we don't really that that cut against our own preferences. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No doubt. Um, well, we're getting close to a close here. I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I did want to ask you, of course, about your music. So you play guitar. Okay. You're doing a lot of Christmas music we, that, yeah. I, that we see. And today I just ran across for the first time. I know it's been out for a little while, but uh, it's a, a post-op Lang Syne, which was. Ah, hilarious. yeah. Did you write those? OK, things? I did. Yeah, did that you? was I think that was. Yeah, that was one of the first things I did that was just um, that Stephen just said, like, write it. So I came up with the I came up with the idea of it being the like we were sitting around in a room and Stephen was just I want I want to do this Dan Fogelberg song and he was like uh, what's it going to be about um, and he said okay so he meets his old lover in a grocery store and I said and she's a guy and that was that was and so I ended up he was like great write that and then come around you know have it by tomorrow and so I I wrote it that night um and yeah it's it's it is goofy it is um the music video that they did for that uh the folks the guy the guys who filmed that yeah uh oh, dirty great. minded they're so funny but um really funny. yeah i love those guys i love those guys um <laughs> so yeah so where'd that was that was is that yeah. where'd you get your pipes from is that your mom your dad do you have but you, you have, my mom you and dad were both yeah my, well thank you my, my mom and dad were both singers uh so i grew up singing um and you know learning harmony as a kid and that was that was like i said that's what i thought i was going to do i thought i was going to do music in in uh, the church uh but ended up just singing uh offensive parody songs on a <laughs> on a conservative late night show there you uh, go but it worked and then you know and then now i sing christmas carols and um that's also fun yes do you have more christmas songs coming out i know you've kind of released a few in the last couple of days yeah, it's not this year, but I would like to do more next year. I'd like okay. to um, really lean into it and maybe maybe do more than I've been able to. So last the so year before last, we did the we did that song, the uh, post the old Lang Syne parody, um, and and I did a holy night at the live Christmas show that night. Then the next year, um, I did two songs on YouTube, one song on uh, Blaze TV. And then this year I just released three songs on YouTube. So what I'd like to do is, so I've done one, one serious Christmas song, two serious Christmas songs, and now three. So I'd, like I said, like to do more and keep, keep uh, expanding on that, but I love it. It's, it, you know, I, I did it because a bunch of people were asking for it. Mm -hmm. And, and as I'm, you know, as I'm thinking about it, you know, being known as the guy who sings Christmas songs is actually pretty cool. You know, I, I, yeah. I, I, I love that. If, if people are looking at me going, Hey, are you going to do Christmas songs this year? And that's my kind of the first, or that's part of my brand, you know, it's, yeah. uh, it's like, you know, making trans jokes and, uh, singing Christmas songs. <laughs> if that's my brand, I'll live with it, man. I'm, yeah, I'm, I love wrong. it. So yeah, it's fun. It, it's what I, it's for some reason what I decided to do. And then people expected more of it. We might not always have trans, but we'll always have Christmas. So you'll always be in business in some capacity. That's, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Yeah. We haven't had the promise of the trans we will always have That's with right. us. We, we haven't heard that. We yeah. don't. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let me ask you this. Um, do you have any questions that you want to ask? Because I wanted to. Oh, do you miss? Um, are, are you still writing jokes? Are you sitting sometimes, you know, in between takes or whatever in, 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 in the little box? And you're like, you know, this is a good joke and you're writing jokes down. Yeah, I, I, so what I've done since uh, being at the Crowder Show, I did a lot of what I do is now on Twitter um, and the other stuff that I like. Last week I did some jokes, uh, just released, just decided to write some monologue jokes. Um, yeah, just as a kind of fun experiment. Another thing that I've been working on for too long, and people have continued to ask about this, is the my satirical book that I've. Uh, that I started working on a while back. Um, and so, yeah, so a lot of, a lot of my joke writing energy has gone into writing the book, doing jokes on Twitter. Um, uh, but yeah, a lot of that kind of time, that focused energy time um, mm -hmm. has been, I've been able to channel that and I'm thankful for that. 
um, because it's a really fun, it's really fun. And it's a kind of, it is a perspective change because um, you can't be, um, you can't laugh and be anxious at the same time. So like with the thing about uh, being mad about the news, like a, a very, a really good and, a, a antidote to that is laughing, is making a joke about it. So yeah. that even if it's, even if it is a serious point and even if it is uh, poking fun at something that you think is gross and disgusting and an overreach of power or tragic or whatever, um, if you can have a funny perspective on it, it's actually a good exercise. It's a, it's a, it's kind of been a fun way to stretch my own mind. Um, so yeah, like I said, you can, you can catch most of my, catch most of my jokes on Twitter. Um, excuse me. Uh, or you can go, uh, well, one, one of these days I will release the satire book and, uh, folks will be able to see what I've been working on there. That's great. Well. Yeah. We will no. definitely get that. Do you see an open lane? Cause I mean, we see the Babylon B for instance, there are there, there's a couple of Christian comedians, but by and large, I don't see a lot of, besides them besides, besides the aforementioned i don't see a sure. lot of really good strong christian comedy do you see an open lane potentially for christian comedians and christian maybe even a christian snl of sorts sure well i think i think that there's definitely a market for it mm -hmm. um and the people you mentioned are good examples of that they're good examples of uh that, that uh, hey, turns out that right wingers or Christians like to laugh too. <laughs> it's it's not. Um, and some you know, of us are the, funny. Yeah, yeah, and, right? and, and that's that's also that's yeah that also can be a surprise to people. Um, <laughs> but the yeah, it. I think that. Um, yeah, I I I I wonder about it. I think it'll be an interesting thing to to watch, yeah. um, and I think that that will track with tech. So as as the tech grows and as um, personalities become more resilient i think comedy will kind of follow that but i think it may also actually be the cutting edge of it and uh, yeah I, I i like i said just, i will be fascinated to see how that all all pans out but yeah I, I think i think that a lot of a lot of christian comedy and a lot of uh conservative comedy can see the target as being the only thing that needs to be right. So it, they may not work on the skill side of things quite as much, but as long as the target is correct, uh, as long as they're poking fun at the right thing, uh, then that's um, enough. And, you know, Seth Meyers invented the term clapter, um, like the difference between laughter and clap, like clapping is a voluntary reaction. Laughing is an involuntary reaction. The same is true of liking a tweet. Clapping and liking a tweet are both voluntary reactions. But actually laughing, that's the kind of thing where I don't know, um, in order to have in order to have a Saturday Night Live that has a live studio audience, that has enough cameras, that has the budget that you need for it, um, it would take a lot. Mm -hmm. But I don't I don't think that's I don't think that's out of the question. But I do think that it's um, it's the kind of thing that a bunch of things need to happen first. Uh -huh. um, and I'll be interested to find out. Um, the steps to get there because yeah. when when saturday night live started it was in 1975 and nbc was this behemoth television meant something yep. johnny carson John, they were running johnny carson reruns on saturday nights and johnny carson went in for a contract negotiation he said i either get paid for these reruns or you you find something else to play on saturdays yep. and they were like okay well i guess we have an hour and a half on saturdays to fill um though there's nothing that means there's nothing right now that means what TV meant in 19, 1975. Um, so there's not this hole that's being created that needs to be filled with something and that can kind of fail for a while as it grows. Yeah. Um, so right now we would have to build the infrastructure in order for there to have, to, in order for even the talent to have a place to exist. And that's why I do admire the folks at the Babylon Bee for building an infrastructure. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that the, the same is true of what, what I was at, like the, where I worked at the Crowder show. Uh, it was an infrastructure. Same, same goes for a lot of the folks at Blaze TV. Those, those infrastructures that people are building, I think are creating a place for comedy. Mm -hmm. And now what it takes is for conservatives and Christians to not be satisfied with just picking the right target, yes. but also with, um, the craft because the craft is ugly the cra or the craft is at least boring it's at least it's the kind of thing that um 
you have to try out in front of an audience and fail. You have to actually, or, or you have to write it enough times to where you eventually actually start laughing at things and you, and you share your jokes with people and they start laughing. Right. Um, the, the craft of comedy is something that I don't know if there's a real, um, you're getting me on a soapbox, but I, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I will, I cut me off when it's, when it's time to end, but, no, um, you're hitting mine too. So uh, this is great. Keep going. Okay, great. So the, um, I think that right now in the age of kind of personal branding, people are selling comedy tickets to comedy shows with kind of a safety net. So, um, I love Tim Dillon. I was talking about Jim Norton earlier. I love Jim. I love Jim Norton. I went to a Dave Landau show when he was in town. Love Dave. Um, and, um, those guys have an audience. And so their audience is going to fill up the room and they're, and so they kind of have a safety net there. They have a bunch of people who are probably going to laugh at their jokes. Like I said, I mentioned, uh, I think I mentioned Tim Dillon, but like there are going to be people, people there who, because they follow him on Twitter, love Tim Dillon. And I've got to see the na- latest Tim Dillon show. They're going to laugh. They're going to give him a little more uh, leeway. So he, while he's trying out new material, but you know what, when Tim Dillon is not going to get that is if he just shows up somewhere and is okay with kind of dying um, and okay with just it, it not going well. Yeah. And that's, that's the kind of thing that I don't think Christians are quite comfortable enough with that yet. I don't think right wingers are comfortable enough with that yet mm-hmm. to just fail a bunch um, and, um, and still have the desire to keep giving. It's it's an irrational thing. I think uh, I, I talked about Nate Wilson earlier. Nate Wilson's also talked about how writers have to be somewhat irrational. They have to care. They have to care more about the thing than is actually reasonable. Mm-hmm. Um, which is like, I mean, which he ta- he said like, Tolkien cared more about Middle Earth than was reasonable. But we yeah. all benefit from that. We yeah. all we all get to enjoy that. Um, and so in the same way, I think, I think that any kind of anybody who's involved in a craft has to care about it a ton more, more, like I said, more than is reasonable. And that's definitely true of comedy. It's the kind of thing that craft crafts, people have to come in who love it. Um, and not just people who want to be seen as funny, but people who love the art of it and love the jokes. I think I was going to Jerry Seinfeld talk about that. He just loves jokes. Uh-huh. Like he just loves the things and, and like likes the structure of it and likes to look at it and goes, that's a good joke. Like he's, he's, he's the guy, he's like the artist who is making more money than anybody else, but you can still picture him standing in the, in like in an art gallery going, yes, this is great. This is cool. So because he just loves the kind of the process and the kind of filth of making it work and not, and it not working for a while. And, yeah. um, and that's, I think that that's, um, going back to what we said about politics, loving the process, loving the kind of journey on the way there and just trusting God that it's going to mean something. And also, also with that kind of irrational love for the art form, the love for what it could be. Um, So we need infrastructure. We also need, if if we're going to have comedy, we need infrastructure uh, for a show to exist. Um, And we also need talented people who have not been uh, yeah basically people who have not had an audience before people who have worked hard mentioning i think there's some really funny conservative comics i think like ryan long is super funny uh i mentioned dave lando he's not he doesn't consider himself very conservative but I, he probably is more conservative now than he has been in the past <laughs> um so love those folks and and i think that i think that I, I don't mean those guys. I think those, I think those guys are people who have actually had to go in the trenches. Um, but I think that, I think that there is a, um, yeah, I think, I think that if we can love the art form, if we can um, love the thing, not just as a, as a way of becoming a star, but as a thing that needs to happen. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's, that's why I do what I do. And it may not be, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not Jerry Seinfeld. I'm not doing anything that uh, is, is, uh, revolutionary to comedy or anything but i try to make people laugh on my twitter and and if if the most i get is people are able to have a fresh perspective and think something's funny that they didn't think was funny something used to make them mad is now funny to them that's a gift that i can they can hopefully give to maybe one person at a time yeah, um but, and but wait, being able all, to serve those people that way all all jerry did was come up with a show that was about nothing 
me. That's true. Yeah. I'm right. Doing more than, than, than Seinfeld. <laughs> well, you know what? I guess you're right. There All right. You I'll take it. There I'll you take go. it. I cut you off earlier when I said, I, you asked uh, me you, I said, I do you have a question? And then I just went on. Do you, you have any questions? Which, okay. I was actually going to ask him if he was writing any satire. Oh. And he answered ah, that. He's boom. writing a satire. I am. That someday we'll come yeah. up. One of these days, yeah. I it's it's the kind of thing where it could take on a bunch of different forms. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm 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 thinking through editing right now, and then and then the question is distribution. So, uh, right. I've got a first first draft, and uh, yeah, thinking through it. And you might even know a publisher, perhaps too. I might, yeah, yeah. That that could work. You know, it's it's honestly it's it's um it is interesting to think through. Um, right now, like my YouTube channel is not Canon's. Uh, but it's something that, a way that I'm able to serve people that's totally consistent with the values of Canon. Um, so yeah, I, it's been fun to kind of figure out, figure out what's Wade work and what's yeah. Canon work. Sure. And, uh, and I, I've loved that. I, I think that being able to cheer on and grow Canon and also be able to, you know, figure out who's this Wade guy who that doesn't have audio in front of his name. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, so yeah, we'll see, we'll see. It, it very well could be uh, a Canon press thing. It could be uh, the kind of thing where I just try to figure out my own thing. I could shop around other people. I it's it, like I said, totally up in the air right now, but I love, I love that it, it, going back to like loving the process. This is, this is fun. This is like a cool, uh, the possibilities are all kind of making it yeah. a blast. Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you this. This is uh, totally not have doesn't have anything to do with that. But what are your thoughts on the metaverse? <laughs> oh, boy, the metaverse. I I think uh, it couldn't have happened any other year. That's my thought. <laughs> I think that I think that 2021, it's like you can't have met the metaverse in 2021 without having 2020 immediately before that. No doubt. Um, you like you lock enough people in their houses <laughs> and uh, where they haven't had human interaction for a long time then this kind of facsimile of reality comes yep. along oh great you can sell it's like yeah it's it really is um yeah it's like selling it's selling something that is not in demand it's like but really it's like it's like a 3d version of second life which has been around for a long long time 15, exactly. 15 years or something yeah. but it's sold at just the right time so it feels revolutionary right um but it's just trying to replace normal life it's trying to replace like there's there are tvs in the metaverse you can watch you can have your character <laughs> sit down at a on a on a fake couch and watch a tv um yeah it, it's but it's it's like it's trying to make reality but it's like why, why in the world would you try to make reality that's like sleeker and a little more boring and flat yeah. than the real world. Um, and that's pretty clear why people would want to do that. They, they, they hate the actual world. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, like I said, I, I really think that it's, it's as far as marketing goes, very smart. It's the perfect time uh, sell, sell people the world when they're forced to be inside. Um, well, you know what you can just put on, you know, you don't want to go outside and put on a mask, stay inside and put on a mask and you get to see the whole world. Isn't, isn't that amazing? But I, I think like, I'm not anti VR. Um, but I am, I, if somebody was like, yeah, I love the metaverse. I'm so excited to be there and play board games with my buddies with my goggles on. Like, I, I would be worried about that guy. <laughs> well, listen, man, the scary thing is I'm seeing this on Instagram. Even today, there's some big mega churches and big names of people that are saying, Hey, we've got a spot in the metaverse and here we are. And you can see your little avatar, your person or whatever can stand here and listen to a gospel yeah. message. And, you know, we're going to take the offering and all this. It's like, man, like we Goodness. have, it, it is a lot of uh, disenchantment going on here when yeah. the world itself has enough to go around god has made this world and it is far better than what any developer can come up with i i did not know about that that's fascinating and frightening it's yes. yeah it is wild but it's 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 a when people have had no hint of human contact when the closest thing they've had is zoom and i'm very thankful for this zoom conversation obviously but um the when the closest thing they've had is zoom it actually feels closer to real life than zoom does zoom church than zoom church does Sure. So, all right. It's, it's uh, it's like, yeah, I, I, I understand why somebody who thinks that Zoom church is okay would think that Metaverse church is okay. 
sure. Uh, it's the it's the exact same logic, but it is a kind of strange logic. There's no way to actually share the same loaf, you know. Exactly. Like there's no, there's no real like there's there's no um you can't get baptized in the metaverse. <laughs> um like well there like the actual like the church is yeah it's it the church is earthy the, the and the the rituals that god gave us are physical and uh the further we get away from that the more this sounds totally normal and and but but before zoom church there was the uh churches that said they had the i campus and that was just their their online live stream and they counted those live stream numbers in the attendance numbers for that sunday oh i just go i go to the i campus so it's like this is it's this the same logic um but it's yeah it's it's always the same uh kind of impulse and that impulse is get me away from real accountability <laughs> get yeah. me away from from real people who actually could bother me into holiness yes. um and love me enough to confront me about the way I snapped at my kid or love me enough to go like, Hey, you're actually like lacking in this way. Or, Hey, you know what? Let me hold this baby so you can go discipline that kid. That you're like there, that's the kind of thing that happens in real life. That's the kind of thing that happens in church, but it doesn't happen in zoom church and it doesn't happen in I campus and it doesn't happen in meta church, which I am just finding out about. Um, <laughs> So I'll send you a link. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you I'm, a I'm bowled over, man. It's crazy. Please. It is crazy. Email me. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Boy. Yeah. So yeah, I, it's not surprising, but I hate it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's sad. It's really yeah. sad. Yeah. It's very sad. Yeah. Do you have anything to follow up? Oh. No, just a thank you so much for your time and for answering all our questions. Oh, I'm thrilled. Thank you guys so much for asking. And Absolutely. For and hopefully at some point we'll get out of the Zoom technological world eventually and maybe we'll get a chance to actually meet you and shake hands or something. Totally. That sounds be, like a thrill. Be human. <laughs> hey, there we go. I'm, I'm all for that. You know me. Wonderful. All right, Wade. Thank you so much. Oh. Well, thank you guys so much too. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the Love of Life podcast, Conversations with Jesse and Courtney. It is our duty through our schools to create a new one, a God-centered one. We are told in Proverbs 8, verses 35 and 36, For whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death.